So if you knew this what I know now, you would be amazed. I, I, I can't even sit quietly anymore because this webinar, this opportunity, Green Node, I'm so blessed I have my Green Nodes running and we are gonna buy more because the, the price of the Green Smart Node is already tripled when we bought it and soon it will be 10 times, 15 times more valuable and we get these green tokens, green coins. You know, they told yesterday that uh, uh, green is going to be listed very soon. We don't know, in two weeks, in two months. But you know, the Jonathan Keeps is the big man behind the solar energy. And he's very wealthy. He didn't have to come to the green and, and do this business. Because he is wealthy, but he sees something in this. And I hope this webinar will open your mind, open your eyes, and you will jump in full as we are full in i uh, yesterday i told in the webinar we are full in we are no no we are not full in we are blessed to be full in and please listen carefully listen many times and i hope you enjoy this webinar and please if you enjoy this webinar if you like what we are please join us to the system and we will start teaching you how to start, how to get those notes, how to do your best in this opportunity. If you have ever wondered what is your mission, I know this is my mission. <laughs> I say I'm a Bauker, <laughs> so I hope you would be too. So see you soon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nigel Allen. Watch out, you know, hold on to your socks. And I, I, I predict everyone here as well is gonna be very, very thrilled when they find out who this man, man, Jonathan Gibbs is. And, you know, we're talking about a man who is a luminary in the solar industry, building one of the fastest growing and most profitable solar companies in existence in the USA, and then walking away from it to start a new venture. So uh, he, he walked away and he decided to set up some software companies. And in the process, he was introduced to Green. When he saw Green, and I don't want to steal his thunder, he's going to tell you himself. When he saw Green, he actually realized he had no choice. He had to do this. And um, he told the founder of Green, uh, because of the way it's been put together, he said, well, I don't even want, look, he's going to, I don't want to give anything away. He's going to tell it. So I'm not, not going to ruin anything. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Jonathan Gibbs, the president of Green. Good evening, Jonathan. Or oh, good morning to you, actually. Yeah. It's Salt Lake City. Good, good evening. Good morning. Good midnight. Uh, I know you've got a talented team all over the world. And, and uh, I was uh, texting the leadership group uh, this morning at, at six o'clock my time. Um, you know, I think I'm the most excited person on this call this morning. I know some of you have really known about Green much longer than me. Um, so I've got that new rep, enthusiasm, excitement uh, in me. You know, I've only really been official now for two weeks. Um, been doing due diligence on the project for about 45 days. Um, I met Wright and some of the team because I was working on a similar idea, putting Bitcoin miners into solar power batteries because I thought there was a way that we could make solar free if we could mine uh, Bitcoin to do that. And um, we are working in some of the same cities and, you know, people recommended that we talked and, um, you know, it's really been an incredible, uh, you know, romance. My romance with Green started with my romance with Wright uh, and his family, really just um, an incredible person. Uh, you know, um, his story is not my story to tell, but I could tell you that um, uh, I'm not impressed easily. And, you know, I've had an opportunity to meet and work with a lot of high net worth individuals. And, uh, and most of them are very, very similar. Um, when they spend their life uh, acquiring a certain amount of money, um, their next goal is to acquire more of it or spend all of their time protecting it. And what we have in Wright and a number of other uh, high net worth individuals that are really actively engaged in this project at a, at a major level um, are people that aren't trying to create more wealth. Um, they're trying to distribute wealth. 
Um, they're trying to create freedom and they're trying to uh, actually, some of them are trying to spend all the money they have before they die. And uh, in, in, in a really meaningful and exciting way. And, and the timing of this, you know, as we all know, timing is, um, is sometimes even more important than opportunity because we could be the right people with the right team. But if we're at the, the wrong time in our lives, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't come together. And so the timing of this for me, um, uh, was very meaningful, very purposeful. And, you know, if you, be, you know, personally, I don't believe in coincidence. So there was also a lot of, um, uh, weird ways that this opportunity was really confirmed for me that let, right. I mean, normally someone like me would take six to 12 months to make a decision like this. Um, so, you know, right. And I making this decision partner up globally, um, on this project in less than 45 days, I think it surprised us both. Um, he's been looking to fill this position for three and a half years. Um, and I was really happy doing what I was doing. Um, you know, I had uh, spent six months um, after leaving Lumio starting something new. I was in love with my team. I loved our business strategy. Um, it was on track to be bigger and more valuable than Lumio in less time. And, and I was really happy, actually. Um, I would say I had the best work-life balance I've ever had over the last six months and, and things uh, were moving very, very quickly and very, very good for me. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things Wright and I share in common is violent transitions. Um, I don't, I've never had a smooth transition uh, from a career um, and maybe even relationships. Uh, most of my transitions have been sudden sudden, huge, violent, uncomfortable transitions. And this was one, like um, we decided to, um, because this project is so personal to write, he's been working on it for seven and a half years. Um, the contract he put in front of me was a 10 year commitment, um, a 10 year exclusive commitment. Uh, now I'm 45 years old. I, uh, I'll, uh, I gotta forgive you in advance too. You have to forgive me in advance too, because this is the first outward messaging that I've done on this topic to, to any group or individual. And so um, I have test drove uh, the presentation twice this morning. I ran long both times. Um, we have another call here in 50 minutes. So I'll, uh, I'll try to keep it in time. But um, you are the first group of people locally or internationally to, to hear um, this message from me. And it's, it's really because of um, the value of the partners and what they've done and how they've invested with us over the last six months that we wanted to prioritize this. So um, here's a little bit about me. I'll just put some of these slides up. These like we'll spend the next 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes on why I'm in love with this project and the team. Some of the things I've done, maybe we've intersected through uh, some of these marketplaces. I also put my, uh, my Instagram, my LinkedIn in the chat. Um, if you'd like to follow me personally and, and, you know, and, uh, and learn more about just, my personal life, my family, you can follow me on Insta, Instagram. Um, Grate Asote is Latin. It means always thankful. Um, I uh, discovered that that is the secret of joy um, in the midst of uh, my darkest season, which was, uh, was 2012, where I was sued by the attorney general of the state that I was working in. Um, my wife at the time started having an affair. I lost custody of two of my children. I tore both my shoulders my Achilles tendon, which is the most painful tendon to tear in your body, um, and my left meniscus, um, and uh, was in a lot, of, um, a lot of personal pain. And I learned then that the secret um, to surviving uh, things like this is cultivating thankfulness, uh, cultivating and growing thankfulness in our hearts that are not tied to our circumstances. So that's what gratia stote means. It's a reminder for me not other people, but to be always thankful. Um, and then my LinkedIn is, you know, my professional background. Uh, some of the things I've done in my life, um, uh, I played football for nine years. I graduated from an Ivy League school here in the United States with two degrees in three years. Um, I was raised by a single mom and an older sister. Um, I got my first fake ID when I was 15. It said I was 17, so I could work for full time at a blockbuster video. Uh, I made $4.25 an hour, and I used to take bagels out of the trash can at our local bagel shop because um, I couldn't afford to buy meals at school. 
And my friend worked at the bagel store and he would throw um, all the bagels in a garbage bag and put them in the trash because that's what his job was. And me and my other friends would take them out of the trash like seconds later. And that was, that's how we paid for our lunch at school for my whole high school. Um, I graduated from college into the dot-com boom. When I graduated into the dot-com boom, AOL was the number one internet provider in the world. Yahoo was the largest search engine. And a year later, they had the opportunity to buy Google for a million dollars. And eBay was the largest e-tailer. And so I worked in that space. I helped uh, three companies go public. Those are three of my four exits. And uh, two of my four exits uh, happened in my early 20s, including a company that I started, which was a domain name auction site. Um, and uh, learned a lot about technology. Uh, learned a lot about scaling projects really, really quickly and creating uh, value proposition and technology. Um, uh, was also working in the film industry at that time, working for free, trying to be, uh, I had an agent for writing screenplays. I'd written five screenplays and one comic book. Um, and that's when a friend of mine invited me over to someone's house for my first MLM presentation. I was 23. I'd never heard of MLM. Um, I didn't really know and understand what it mean, what it meant, but someone showed me a way to get paid. Every time someone turned on a light, watched television, or made a long distance phone call in 1999, 2000, and it seemed really interesting to me. And um, I did that full time for three years. I was with a company called ACN. Um, my last month with ACN, I was number one in the world after launching Australia. Uh, we did, I signed up 10,000 reps and 100,000 customers in the first 30 days um, by going in there and doing something similar to this, like doing a pre launch phase for 90 days where the company's official systems and platforms weren't live yet. Um, uh, but we, um, we built kind of a Band-Aid system, like just our team. It wasn't the company. It wasn't sponsored by the company. It was just me, just me and my team at like 24, 25. And um, we recruited 10,000 people plus on paper, signed them all up on one day. We had verbal agreements with who were going to be our customers, signed them all up on one day literally put 300 plus million dollars worth of billing on their platform in the first month. And, um, and, uh, and then I uh, moved on, found something else to do. I'm thankful for my time in that industry. Uh, it taught me a lot on personal development, human behavior, um, and uh, motivating excellence um, through inspiration and personal development versus fear, where I think a lot of uh, large companies today motivate their workforce on fear. Um, I went into title services, kind of like a weird thing, um, but I transferred 50,000 titles and dozens of countries um, over the next seven years uh, for property and property management. And then I've been in solar for 10 years. Um, along the way, somewhere, some uh, I, I think Nigel shared the video last week, um, me and some of my friends, for absolutely no good reason, decided to jump out of a perfectly good helicopter into a volcano. So I've got uh, some uh, experience with volcanoes. If, if we need to, uh, if we need to use uh, volcanoes to power, uh, uh, to make huge power plants like they do in in, uh, in some areas of Scandinavia, I've come really close with a volcano. So um, I've had a total of four exits. Um, I have achieved. Uh, all the financial goals I set out to achieve in my 20s, 30s, and 40s. And um, last year, I really wasn't planning on working this year. Um, that wasn't the plan. Uh, the plan was to take time off because um, while this is what I've done, um, this is um, why I'm doing it. And Nigel, just want to check with you really quickly. Uh, the screen is, is coming up real good on your side. Thank you, Aaron, for your head nod. I appreciate that. Absolutely, yeah. We can see all your pajamas. Yeah, we can see the pajamas. So. So I have nine kids and, um, and I live in Utah and that's just with one wife. We moved here. Uh, if you look at Hannah on the right over here, um, if she doesn't look old enough to have nine kids, she's really not. Um, before I met Hannah, I adopted a family of, of seven. Um, they had um, one mom and, and five fathers and all their fathers were not involved. And the most recent father had just gone to jail and I met them through uh, my church by just taking food to their home as just part of an outreach program, which is something that I enjoy to do. And uh, I found this mom and seven kids living in a two bedroom apartment. Um, they were zero to 13. And I realized uh, instantly I hadn't brought enough tacos. 
And uh, so we went and got some more tacos and I just started going back week after week and, uh, and somewhere in the next couple of years, um, uh, I just kind of adopted the mom, got her some job skills and things like that and the family. And they've been in my life for 13 years. Uh, they've all lived with me at times, um, sometimes one at a time if they needed personal attention, sometimes the whole family. Um, cause the project was really to help get the family up on their feet and, you know, and help the mom support her own kids in their own house where they could live together. Um, you know, not just take them out of that environment. And so it, it's been, um, it's been an amazing last 13 years. This is precious. She's my 21 year old. Her best friend Paris is living with us, uh, here in Utah. This is her fiance Dawson who works at green and they've been in, uh, they've been dating for five years. So it's really hard to convince the kids in my house that fairy tales don't come true because um, we've had the opportunity to do just incredible business things. And, uh, you know, people are marrying their high school sweethearts and, um, and it's just kind of like an amazing uh, blended family. This is D'Angelo. He's my 18 year old. He's sold a little bit of solar. Uh, he's worked at a restaurant and he's about to move into our customer service team uh, at Green also. Whenever we do something, we really like to do it as a family. We like to get kind of everybody involved. Um, this is Bentley Doodle. Uh, Bentley has his own Instagram page, Bentley Doodle. Uh, this is our golden doodle. <laughs> and um, he's just like a version of Hannah reincarnated as a dog. So Hannah, um, I'm the CEO. Hannah is our CLO. We call that our chief love officer. And so um, she takes on the role of making sure um, we have plenty of family activities and there, there's plenty of love to go around. Um, my two biological children are uh, Summer Joy and Ciara Grace. Uh, they are not twins. They are Irish twins. They're actually about a year apart. And um, they actually spend more time with their mom in uh, San Diego than me. Uh, but we're working on that. We're hoping to spend um, a lot more time together here really soon. That's being worked on. Um, my 23-year-old lives in Colorado. This is uh, Cody, and he is in digital forensics. And so he might be going to work here pretty soon for the Liberty blockchain. We're excited about that. Um, here's, here's another picture of just Hannah, uh, my wife, Bentley. And this is my Lumio office. It, um, this isn't the best picture, but had the, it had 180 degree views of the most incredible mountains um, uh, here in Utah. So that was a lot of fun to work out of. Uh, my older three are uh, 24, 28, and 29. This is Nicole, Michael, who just uh, retired as a Marine, um, and his wife and family. He actually has four boys now. They just had one. And Tony, the oldest, 29, we just moved him to um, Utah. And what we're doing as a family right now is COVID kind of spread us out all over the world. Um, and as a lot of people, you know, wanted to create healthy living situations for especially the kids and make be closer to peer groups. And, um, and now we're trying to all come back together. We've chosen Utah as that location. And so we have a two-year game plan to move everybody here and find meaningful roles in either the Green Project or other projects. Uh, Precious, my 21-year-old, who I showed you, um, she's really excited about the GIVE uh, program. Um, we want to... Um, as a family, we've supported financially like orphanages in Cambodia and, and, uh, and uh, Zambia and a lot of other places. But um, her passion is the Philippines. So she's going to help us start um, an orphanage in the Philippines. And we want to do that through the GIP blockchain. Um, we picked Utah for some really specific reasons. So um, I really like the outdoors. Um, we, love to, we love to play. Uh, if you're ever in Utah, you, you have to come over. We can take you skiing or um, our whole family's gotten into uh, wake surfing, which is surfing behind um, uh, behind a boat. And when you get good enough, you can let go of the rope and uh, and you can just surf. And as someone who grew up in like California and Australia, um, that's a lot of fun um, because a, a good wave in Australia might be five seconds or six seconds. And you can surf behind these boats for two or three minutes or as as long as your legs can hold you. And so that's something we're getting into. So there's a lot of outdoor activity, but something else is happening here in Utah. So, um, so again, I graduated into the first dot-com boom um, 26 years ago. And Silicon Valley has been the hub of technology, not just in the United States, but around the world for, for 18 years. And there has been a huge shift in the last 12 months to a place called Silicon Slopes, um, which is three miles from where I'm sitting right now. And right, and, and the evidence of this over the last few years is these are reports um, dating back to um, 1965 
of economic development and how Utah is leading right now. The area that um, that I built Lumio in, that um, Green is being headquartered, a lot of their operations being headquartered here, has really become the center of technology for the United States. And so one of the centers of technology um, globally is this little town called Lehigh, Utah, and it's literally beating out Silicon Valley, New York, Dallas, in almost every single financial category in business and technology. And um, it's creating a talent density that has only been seen in Silicon Valley in the last 20 years. It, this really hasn't been seen anywhere else in the globe. And so it's, it's one of the things that I've learned in life is, you know, a hack of greatness is simply getting next to greatness, right? Getting in a close proximity to other big thinkers, other big doers, forces us to think bigger and do bigger in order to compete. And so when you have so many talented companies in a very small radius, Silicon Valley is not San Francisco. Silicon Valley is about 10 miles um, east of San Francisco, and it's about 20 miles north of San Jose. It's its own region. And it used to be sort of a sleeper town. Before there were big businesses there, people were working out of homes and working in warehouses well, they built the Apple campus and they built the Expedia campus and they built the Google campus. Like there was nothing there. It was a really, it was an affordable place to live in 1996, 97, 98. And so a lot of the startups were starting in homes. What happened between 1999 and, and 2002, 2003 is homes that were worth $200,000. They went up to $2 million and then they went up to $5 million. And so like everybody started moving in um, it started becoming the epicenter for growth ideas. And so when you're recruiting in that environment, if you don't have a big idea, you can't recruit the best people. And when you get a lot of the best people, they're competing with a lot of the other best people. And so it just, it creates greatness. It creates greatness at just an incredible um, level of talent density. And um, one of the good books that sort of explains the significance of this, not just for Silicon Valley, but globally, it's a book called Blitzscaling. Um, I'm going to reference this book twice on this call. Um, if you want to join me in my mindset and understanding and understand um, some of the strategies that we're going to use together over the next couple of years to build this, this big, beautiful company together, um, those are two books that I've read in the last five years that have really become a part of the like my business DNA, how I look at things and how I process things. One is called Blitzscaling. It talks a lot about what I'm just talking about right now. And the other is um, play bigger. And they both focus on this unique environment in Silicon Valley and how Silicon Valley has changed the world. Companies, if you incorporate your company in Silicon Valley, you are 5,000 times more likely to become a billion dollar business than any other city in the world. And this shift has changed since I've moved here. So in the last, our family's taking credit for it, like humorously. Um, but since we moved here, uh, Silicon Slopes has produced more new, uh, has minted more new uh, unicorn startups, startups that have a billion dollar value than any other city in the world. And, and, and I think it's important that you understand um, Dubai is going to be important. Berlin is going to be important. You know, Bombay is going to be important. There's going to be a lot of important cities um, in the development of green. But this, it's important for any technology company, any software company, it's extremely important that they have a substantial presence in Silicon Slopes right now because it is quickly becoming the epicenter for technology um, in the United States and, and globally. And so what I would say is, um, who are you spending time with? Right, because I moved my entire family to this city so that when they were going to Starbucks or when they were working in a restaurant, there are different conversations at that restaurant and that Starbucks than in other Starbucks all over the world. My 18-year-olds are having conversations about cryptocurrency, right? My 21-year-olds are having conversations about starting businesses because that's what their parents are having conversations about. That's what the entire community is having conversations about. And it's um and because of the density of development that's taking place here. So I moved my whole family to a region of the world where they could just be exposed to more, where, where people, even their age, are thinking bigger, doing bigger, because um, I benefited 
uh, from that when I was their age, but I had to fly all over the world to get next to those people, right? Um, I had to go to Australia. I had to move uh, from California to Texas to take advantage of it. Um, and, and this time, I didn't want just myself to benefit it. You know, as a parent, and I know there's lots of parents on here, the gift that we want to give um, our kids more than anything else is the gift of understanding, right? The gift of knowledge, right? Um, how knowledge can shortcut so much of the, the painful lessons we had to learn or the things that we had to learn the slow way. And this is one of my greatest hacks and why I've moved my family here is because um, who you spend time with ends up being the most critical part of our personal and professional development. So are the people you spend time with, are they people from your past or your future, right? In the, in the book, Blitzscaling, it talks about sacrificing perfection for speed. Um, I was quoted in Forbes last year saying speed is the currency of solar. And um, that's because solar was my, my, my business, right? That was my industry of, uh, of uh, experience. But I really, speed is the ultimate KPI for any business on the planet right now. And speed is actually more valuable than systems and processes right now. And it talks about how if you're going to build something big and fast so that the big companies in the world who have more money than you and more budgets than you don't just copy your business plan and, and then beat you up and destroy you with your own business, right? Because they are, they're more deployed, they have more resources, they have more sophistication. You got to launch quickly. You got to launch big. You got to launch so big and so fast that nobody has time to catch you. And even if you have to sacrifice operations, experience, bugs, um, build a team that can survive that because you got to get everywhere really fast today to be a legitimate global company. I'm going to show you how we use that strategy in Lumio. The team, like I was in solar for seven years. Then I spent a year building the strategy and then we executed the strategy so quick in 18 months. We went from $50 million in sales to $700 million in sales in one, in one year, and then, and then $1.2 billion in sales, and we became one of the biggest companies in our space before anybody had time to react. We did it so big and so fast. It was so disruptive. People didn't have a chance to catch us. Now, doing this, one of the things we did is we took a solar install from 90 days to 30 days. And understand that it was so disruptive. We were doing things that nobody had done before. There were so many problems. I mean, things were breaking every day. Things were going wrong every day. And so Blitz Scaling talks about assembling the plane on the way down. And that's what we were doing, right? Like we were all in. We had committed huge money, huge resources um, to this idea that what if we could be more than twice as fast as everybody else? And the idea was working, but it was very manual. Um, there was a lot of band-aids. There was a lot of temporary solutions. And there was a lot of pain and discomfort. That's where we are right now. That's what the next six months is looking at right now. So I want to give you a disclaimer right now. And I want to just give you a disclaimer um, at the end of this call right now, which is if you want something smooth, if you want something fully cooked, if you want something that is not risky and that is really easy, um, keep Nigel and everybody's information and, and get back to us in six months. That's not what we're at right now. And if we were at, if we were at that stage right now, they, they, they wouldn't need me, right? Because I'm the guy that knows how to build in chaos, right? And I teach my teams, listen, there's, I tell them, expect a lot of problems, expect a lot of dysfunctions. And when we get together, focus on the strategizing to overcome those problems. Don't focus on the complaining. If you want to complain about the problems, I didn't recruit you the right way. I didn't set your right expectations. We're going to have a ton of problems. If we're going to be one of the most widely um, used blockchain projects in the world, we're going to have to overcome more problems over the next 12 months than any other blockchain uh, company in the world. And that's what we're set out to do. And that's what I'm preparing my team for, my family for. That's what I'm preparing myself for. I'm preparing myself for the biggest fight of my life. Like if what we do, if we do it on a meaningful way, it will be extremely difficult. Um, it will have violent changes. It will be very frustrating. But you know what? Um, everything I've ever done, if it was meaningful, it was hard. Right. And so um, this is a team. This is a situation. So what do we build? Um, Lumio in, in, in 18 months became the most profitable residential solar company 
um, in America, number three in um, install volume, number one in speed, number one uh, green company to watch, um, uh, top 10 startups to watch, over a billion, but so many awards, it's first year in business. Um, the strategy that I executed there is the same strategy that we're going to execute here. Um, you know, the development and ideas behind Lumio were six, seven years in the making. The development behind Green is six and a half years in the making. Green has been software in software development for six and a half years. It's been distributed as a blockchain project for three and a half years. Um, if I came in two years ago, I couldn't do what they're asking me to do. I could only do it now. It's only now that this project is ready to be blitz scaled. Only now is this project ready for someone like me or someone with my skill sets that wants to launch it all over the world simultaneously? Everything that has been done over the last three and a half years has literally prepared someone like me to step in right now and make meaningful progress, right? And um, and we talked about like the right time. So um, I'm running slow, but I'll uh, I'll kind of zip through this. So basically, the short version is I didn't work for four months, and um, it's the first time since I was 15 years old that I didn't, that I took off more than two weeks. And it was a life change experience for me. And I came up with a formula and I decided, you know, if I went back to work again, it had to check all these boxes. It had to combine my favorite things of every industry, right? I had to love the team because my favorite things and everything I do is the team. And I got to tell you, like these leaders you guys have, um, Stefan and Aaron and Nigel and, you know, KMG, all these guys, all these guys, they're they are so easy to love. <laughs> I'm sure you know this better than me, but um, I spent 12 years studying love, and um, and uh, the Greeks have seven words for the word love. One, um, the highest form of love in the ancient Greek language is agape love, and it is um, it's not eros love. Eros love is like lust, like passionate young lover love. It's, it's, it's referred to as like patriarchal love and it's unconditional love. It means I can, if love is a hundred percent, the decision of the giver. So I can love Nigel, even though I don't, I haven't known him for more than 45 days. He doesn't have to perform a certain way or do something. It's my choice to love him. And I can love him unconditionally outside of how long we've known each other or how he benefits me. And that's how I built my Lumio team. Um, that's how I want to build this team. And I got to tell you, this is a, this is an easy group of people to love. It's already been a lot of fun, having a ton of fun here. I want something that can move, um, as, this, as fast as the speed of thought while solar was fun. And we did a lot of big things. Solar is really slow. There's a lot of moving pieces. And, um, one of the reasons why, uh, I was okay to leave Lumio is it's too slow for me. I want to go faster. So zero to a billion dollars in 18 months, that's too slow for me. That's too slow. It's too slow in the new economy. It's too slow in web point three, way too slow in blockchain. I wanted to move. Um, I wanted to build an area where if someone had a good idea, if one of you has a good idea, that we could implement that good idea in less than 30 days. So we don't have to wait a year, two years um, to capitalize on that good idea. Solar has no residual income. My title has no residual income. I miss my residual income. Uh, from 2004 and 2005. So that's why I look at software. Software has uh, great forms of residual income. Um, obviously, the node, this node of purchase something one time and have it generate you four or five different kinds of uh, income streams um, over the next 10 years, that's really exciting. I think that the node structure itself is the absolute best form of residual income I've ever seen. Um, you know, in network marketing that I did, um, the type of work that we had to do um, 17 years ago to generate money was hard, like really hard. There was no, um, you know, automatic text messaging platforms and other types of things. There was no auto pay and, and it was just really, really hard. And most people really didn't have an equal opportunity. Today, if you buy a node today, you are benefiting in the exact same way that I benefit um, or right thirst and the creators benefit. In fact, some of you, if you already own a node, you own more green than me. We can go to my wallet right now. I've got 15,000 green. Um, I'm about to turn on uh, the maximum amount of nodes they'll let me. But I am here because I have the early opportunity to buy nodes. That's why I'm here. I'm not here. I have no equity. There's no equity. It's, there's, there's, there's no CEO of Bitcoin. There's, 
um, with equity. There's no CEO of green with equity. The plan here is not to take it public. The plan here is to build um, a blockchain project that is owned by the community, just like Bitcoin, that anybody can mine this based on their decisions. So I'm investing the maximum amount that they will let me um, invest to buy the maximum amount of nodes. And that's my upside. So if you've been in this pro, uh, program for six months or a year, you have way more green than me right now. And the chances are that the milestones that we achieve over the next six months will make you way more income uh, than it will me um, because my primary way of being compensated is buying nodes and mining green. And I love it, right? And we'll talk more about it. Um, I think that that opportunity is better for me and my family than starting another traditional company, which I had started three months ago and taking it public and selling it for billions of dollars with the restrictions they put on the CEOs and the lockout periods and the vesting periods. I like my opportunity at Green, which is exactly your opportunity at Green, right? It's a smart contract. I have to buy the nodes, do the smart contract. Um, you know, there's no way to manipulate that. Um, I've bought nodes already. I'm planning on buying uh, a lot more nodes. I'm hosting them um, all around the world on a distributed platform. Every single person on this phone really has the same opportunity in green uh, that I have. Um, even though I have, I'm choosing to take on uh, responsibilities to further the adoption of this coin. Um, that's really my choice, right? And, uh, and um, because the first year could have more work than reward, um, Wright has funded um, a budget for me and a income me for the first year, but I've never done anything for its one-year earning potential. Like I'm looking at this as the five-year earning potential, the 10-year earning potential, and the five and 10-year earning potential for me is coming from me buying nodes this month, setting up and hosting them this month, and what that reward can look like for me and my family over the next 10 plus years, right? I wanted something that had low employees and high E, but uh, this is blockchain. This is decentralization. Oh my gosh. Blo uh, um, Gala made over a billion dollars last year in income and revenue with less than you know 500 distributed coders and um, thousands of gamers that basically invested in the system. And it has more revenue than almost every major blockchain project in the world combined. You know, you take out, you take out five or 10 um, blockchain projects. And Gala is one of the most successful blockchain projects in the world right now. And that fit this criteria. And I want to change the world. So we're going to talk about that. Um, all right. Why do I love green? Um, man, I think that um, I'm going to highlight some of this and then, and then maybe jump into the green deck here. Um, so why do I love green? The first and foremost reason that I love green that I'm excited about is I've been involved in blockchain since 2016. And I've talked at um, tech conferences, I've written white papers, I've helped launch coins. Um, I started a hedge fund for ICOs in 2016 and 17. I've raised a lot of money. I've personally mined you know, over 100 Bitcoin a month in a multi-million dollar mining pool. Um, and there are not a lot of coins that have been distributed organically like Bitcoin. In fact, almost none. So um, there's a lot of regulation coming in the United States. And um, understanding that in coming off of Lumio and being 45, the next 10 years represents my greatest earning potential of my life, right? I just closed the biggest deal of my life, a multi-billion dollar deal. And the earning, like men globally and, and women earn the most amount of money per hour per year between 45 and 55. So this is how I'm choosing to invest like the highest earning hours of my life. And I wouldn't do it if I thought that it was really risky because I have lots of opportunities to go out and make, you know, you know, put a B at the end of my name and, you know, doing traditional capital markets, right? Building traditional companies that can go public and create shareholder value, like blah, 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 right? And, and uh, blockchain a couple of years ago would have been really risky to go full time. And the reason why I feel like this is the best time for me is there's a lot of regulation coming to the United States that I'm excited about. Regulation that's going to work retroactively and any coin projects that were distributed like Cardano, like through an ICO, I believe could have permanent consequences. And a lot of big projects were sold through ICOs as securities and they are about to be regulated as securities. Bitcoin is not a security because it was there was no ICO. They never raised money for it. They never, it was never 
position to the ecosystem as an investment. People made up their own minds. If you were interested in Bitcoin during the first seven years, you had to basically get on a website like Green and download a node and run it yourself and figure it out yourself. And there was no marketing. There was no promotion. There was no forks. There was no founders tax like in mining ZEC. There was no pre-mining like in Ripple. There was no forks like in Litecoin. Most major projects in blockchain today are not real. They distributed their coins and their projects by automatically piggybacking Ethereum or Bitcoin and giving everybody that owned Ethereum a free coin that they didn't need or want. And so what happened is if you had the right wallet connected to these airdrops or these forks, you accumulated the coin. And if you didn't have the right wallet, you still accumulate it virtually. You just couldn't see it. Well, the exchanges set up all the virtual wallets. So the exchanges have been getting all these free coins for years. It's not real. Nobody downloaded the coin. Nobody opted into the projects. Nobody said, I want to support this project. Everybody that had a Bitcoin got a free Litecoin for free. We do not value things that we get for free. We do not value things that people, can you imagine? I want you to imagine this really quickly. I want you to imagine if somebody put a homemade sandwich on your front door. Now the sandwich looked good, it looked right, but it was just wrapped in plastic. Because you don't know anything about the sandwich, where it came from, right? Who made it, right? Like what could be in it? You don't eat the sandwich. Now, maybe some people eat the sandwich, but even if you're hungry, you probably don't eat the sandwich. This is how many projects were distributed. Now, what's so funny about this is if we order the sandwich from Uber Eats or DoorDash and the exact same sandwich shows up wrapped the exact same way, we eat the sandwich, because we asked for it. We, we, were, we were involved in the ordering of it. We were involved in the building of it. We understood it. Um, Green Coin and has one of the oldest and most distributed organic communities in all of blockchain right now, even in its beta period. And I, I need to spend more time on this, but I got to move on. Um, I believe that it holds the potential to be one of the most widely used blockchains um, projects in the world as we tie it to human behavior of paying your power bill every single month. I think this is really, really important because most people do not use their Bitcoin. Um, I know that, um, like I, I've been in crypto again since 2016, 17. One of the projects I like a lot is MANA. Um, uh, you can use MANA to buy virtual real estate in a video game called Decentraland, which is a metaverse project. And it's one of the biggest metaverse projects in the world right now. And I've owned MANA for five years and I've never used it to buy virtual real estate. I bought it for 10 cents. It's been my best trade. It's now trading at $2.67, right? So I made whatever that is, 27 times, right? I didn't make that on Bitcoin. I started buying Bitcoin at 3,000. I bought most of my Bitcoin between six and 20,000. I converted all of like 90% of my net worth to Bitcoin in 2018 and 2019. I did it for security reasons. I thought it was safer than storing my money in a bank. And I've been pleased with what's happened to the price. But I have not used my crypto to do anything. It's slow. It's hard to use. A lot of companies don't accept it. And I didn't buy it to use it. I bought it as an investment. I thought it would go up in value. But when everybody is buying it for that reason and no one is using it, People aren't using Dogecoin at McDonald's. People aren't using Bitcoin at the movie theater. Most of the community, when I mean most, I mean like 99% of the 5% of the world that has any exposure to blockchain at all, they're buying it out of pure speculation. So if we can take one of these projects that's, that still has speculative value and we can get the community to use it every month, because every month we have an incentive to use it to pay our power bill. And we get a reward for playing our power bill. Um, the adoption of those users will um, add a lot of value to this project. And it will not be hard to become one of the most widely used blockchain projects in the world. Um, again, um, this software started off as efficiency. Um, um, Wright Thurston and many of his partners were would collaborate on some of the largest Bitcoin mining operations in the world. At one point together, they were mining 10 to 12% of all the Bitcoin in the world. Can anybody tell me the first thing you have to do when you mine Bitcoin? Has anybody mined Bitcoin? 
So here, let's do it this way. Um, in the chat, I want let's let's. I'd like to get everybody to to take a guess in the chat. So in 2019, I was mining 100 Bitcoin a month, and one Bitcoin would go to paying my rent, and one or two Bitcoin would go to paying my administrative and accounting fees and things like that. And the first thing you have to do when you mine Bitcoin is you have to pay your power bill. So out of the 100 Bitcoin that I could I could potentially mine, how much Bitcoin did it take to pay my power bill? Type a number in the chat. So you have 16, it's a good guess. Pascal, thank you for being first. 50%, 45%, 80%. Rimbidus, 80 to 85%. Out of the 100 Bitcoin I mined, I had to turn around and pay 80 to 85 Bitcoin on my power bill. And if I didn't pay my power bill, I couldn't mine any more Bitcoin. This is why a lot of people are saying that Bitcoin is actually the virtual storage of electricity because right now it can take thirty or forty thousand dollars to mine a Bitcoin that retails for forty four thousand dollars, right? It is spending electricity, consuming electricity in order to create this asset, and then that asset can be stored virtually in our wallets. And the software started by saying, "Hey, instead of mining a hundred Bitcoin a month, Jonathan, what if you could mine?" you know, 5,000 Monero for the same cost of power and then back sell it into Bitcoin and have 200 Bitcoin. You would, be, you, would be, you would be mining Bitcoin more efficiently by mining other coins and then trading it for Bitcoin. And that's what the software did. Green literally tracked how much consumption all the coins were taking to mine in real time so that Bright could mine Bitcoin as energy efficient as possible, which is what Elon Musk and all these world leaders are talking about right now. And then ultimately, the hardware and the software had a lot of limitations, so they had to create their own, right? In the right, and and uh, and it's ready to launch right now, right? We have been in a beta for three and a half years. We are going to be in a pre-launch for three and a half months, and before the end of the year, the world is going to know about this coin, or I'm going to die trying. And this project has been in development, I would say, for a hundred years. This is a real newspaper from the New York Times in 1921 of Henry Ford, right? The largest manufacturer in time of the automobile. He wanted to replace gold with energy currency to stop wars. And his idea, he was teaming up with Thomas Edison and he was going to build a giant hydro mine on a fast moving river in Tennessee. And he said, look, we don't, we could create electricity with water. And every country has running water and we could create reliable electricity and electricity could back our currency because everybody is going to need this resource. Like every home is going to need electricity. And then if every country on the planet could do it in a fair way, we wouldn't need to fight over gold. And what happened, unfortunately, in the United States in the 70s is we dropped the gold standard and we converted to oil. And right now, if you want to buy a barrel of oil anywhere in the world, you have to convert your currency to USD first. And the USD is backed by energy in the form of oil. But as there's a movement globally away from dirty energy to clean energy, we don't want to back our energy with natural gas anymore. We don't want to back our energy with oil anymore. And there's a movement Here's what's happening. The world is asking for green and they're hoping that someone can come up with it. And they don't realize what the world is about to find out is that everything they're asking for already exists. And it has all the backing and all the money and all the development to actually achieve what people are asking for right now. Not a year from now, not two years from now, right now. Here's Elon Musk. Here's a year ago, Elon Musk. So fast forward a hundred years, a hundred years from Henry Ford. Look at this. Look at this. It's so cool. Right? A hundred years later, Elon says, you can now buy a Tesla with Bitcoin, with electricity. Whoa. Tesla is using only internal and open source software that operates Bitcoin nodes. Tesla is operating Bitcoin nodes directly. Bitcoin paid to Tesla will be retained as Bitcoin, not converted to fiat. We are not using this as a hedge against fiat. We are recognizing it is its own currency, and we plan on selling our products for this currency in the future. When he dove in, he said, I love it. But one thing, 
I love it. But one thing, Tesla has suspended vehicle purchasing using Bitcoin. We are concerned about the rapidly increasing use of fossil fuels for Bitcoin mining and transactions, especially coal, which has the worst emissions of any fuel. Cryptocurrency is a good idea. And on many levels, we believe it is a promising future, but this cannot come at a great cost to the environment. Tesla will not be selling any Bitcoin and we intend to use it for transactions as soon as mining transitions to more sustainable energy. We are looking for other cryptocurrencies that use less than 1% of Bitcoin's energy. So they're saying, we want a Bitcoin. We want something that looks like Bitcoin. No one owns it. It was distributed organically, right? It can, you, the, the node owners vote on the consensus. This isn't controlled by a corporation or an individual. The node owners vote on it, just like the Gala nodes and the green nodes. This is what we want, but we want it now and we want it 90 times more efficient than Bitcoin. Green is 20,000 times more efficient than Bitcoin. Now, today, right now, you can use a node miner right now today and you can spend eight to $10 a month in power to mine a hundred dollars worth of green in value and, and exchange it for that hundred dollars on Uniswap right now. It is literally 20,000 times more efficient in the conversion of power to data than Bitcoin. All right, a couple more things, a couple more things really fast. I'm running out of time. All right. Um, so what else can we do with this? I'm going to come back to this right here. Two billionaires in Australia are committing $22 billion to build an undersea cable to take solar power from Australia to Singapore, right? Because Singapore doesn't have land mass. Um, solar power is, it is the cheapest cost of power in the world. It's cheaper than coal or, or, or natural gas. And so they want to use that. But how do we transfer it? How do we move electricity around the world? This is an old idea. This is what they did 40 years ago for telephones. Look at this. Exxon, the largest, one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world is mining Bitcoin by converting the flares from the flare gas, which used to be pollution. And I have friends that are doing this in Utah. I was going to do this in Texas, actually, and I'm uh, abandoning this project to, uh, to do green. But I had 100 locations in Texas where we can take the pollution, the flare gas with the generator, turn it into electricity, drop ship a shipping container with Bitcoin miners and do a microgrid that turns renewable electricity into Bitcoin. This is a big thing. Exxon's doing this right now. So let me go to the green deck here. Oh, you guys have to watch me on time. I'm just so excited. I'm, I'm, I'm going out. This is probably the longest way possible. So, so let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at a couple concepts right here. Um, let's take a look at it. Um, here, I want to take a look at it. Let's just take a look at this. Yeah. We have a max amount of time here. Okay. Realize how significant this is. So now we're all becoming aware of the metaverse, right? A metaverse is just multiple realities. So think in terms of multiple platforms, right? You have a movie theater, you have you know, Netflix, you have cable, you have YouTube, you have Disney Plus, you have your phone, your tablet, TVs, all of that's merging into one thing, right? Where you can watch content across that's transmitted multiple different ways on multiple devices. That's a form of the metaverse, right? Just like Doctor Strange moves in and out of multiple universes in Marvel comic books, right? So we have a universe where things are practical and physical, this universe on the earth where you can touch things like paper, right? And the fax machine takes paper and turns it into data. It turns it into Morse code. Morse code is ones and zeros, right? It's a straight line or a dot. Morse code is the original binary language. And it turns paper into Morse code, basically ones and zeros, and sends those ones and zeros anywhere in the world and turns it back into paper. So this goes from our universe to the metaverse through a variety of transmission. This could be satellite, this could be under oceanic cables, this could be local cable, this could be cell phone network, boom, turns it back into paper. So something that used to take, if I had a private jet, I could take a box of papers and send it to China for you know $250,000 in 24 hours or for a few pennies, I can do this. Watch this. This is a metaverse project. What if I had a 3D printer and a 3D printer and I had the code to print a gun? Right. And what if your country was invaded and you have a 3D printer 
and I can send the data to your 3D printer and your 3D printer can print out a gun. And in less than one hour, you could defend your family by printing a gun uh, on the other side of the world. We're taking data, ones and zeros, and turning it into something physical. This is turning something physical into data into something physical. All right, one more example. Voice. When I was 24 years old, I signed up in a network marketing company to sell long distance service. I made over a million dollars a year at my first year at 24 selling long distance service. Long distance doesn't even exist anymore. The reason why long distance was expensive is because long distance was being transmitted all over the world through sound waves and sound waves take up a lot more space on cable than data. And so you could, you needed a lot more cable to send the sound waves all over the world. And so it was really expensive because you can only send so many sound waves at the same time over the same cable. And so long distance calling China, calling everywhere was a dollar a minute, $2 a minute, $3 a minute, came down to 10 cents a minute, 20 cents a minute, came down to $20 a month, unlimited calling. And now we can not just send voice, we can send phone, we can FaceTime for free. We can WhatsApp video talk for free, for free. Why? Because we're changing something physical. A sound wave is physical. If you've ever been at a sporting event or somewhere where you hear a jet break the speed of sound, you can feel the sound wave hit you. Boom. A sound wave is physical, right? The right sound wave can um, an army marching on a bridge in unison has to has to stop marching in unison or the sound wave can literally move the bridge in the same form of the sound wave, right? We're converting a sound wave into ones and zeros and reassembling it. And here's what's exciting. We're reassembling it with our same accent, with our same um, uh, tone and pitch. It's amazing. Okay, here's what we're doing. Skipping all this, skipping all this. Here's green. If you want to explain green to someone, here's how you explain green. We are taking a physical asset of electricity, which is the most widely used asset in the world for all of our hosting platforms, for um, all of our needs, every website we do, all of our content, um, all of our phone. You can't live without a phone today. Everything requires electricity. Every human being on the planet needs electricity for comfort and business everywhere in the world. We are turning that physical asset into data through mining. We're doing it more efficiently, a multitude, a hundred times, more than a hundred times more efficient than Bitcoin. And you can text that data anywhere in the world and convert it back into electricity by paying your power bill, by buying power in a retail energy environment, or you, once it's data, you can turn that electricity into buying power to buy any kind of good and service. Right now, right now, you can take, you can take, uh, you know, a node that costs fifty six hundred dollars, and it's mining a little less than seven hundred green a month, and you can turn that green into two hundred two hundred ten dollars USD right now. And so, if you're running that node on your uh, computer at home. It's costing you five to ten dollars a month in power to do that. That's amazing. There's no other project on the planet that I know of that is doing this. This is amazing. So let's look at these guys in Australia. I can create a retail energy desk. We can literally transport this um, all over continents: um, Africa, India, um, China. They have thirty to forty percent of their population doesn't have a bank account and doesn't have electricity. And it's because no one wants to build the infrastructure to remote village. Um, we don't have to. We can build a microgrid in that village and people can buy, um, families can send their families in that village green and they can buy the electricity with that green. And we can send that value all over the world the same way you send uh, a text message. Facebook, the world's largest content provider. They don't make any content. The average person on Facebook publishes a newspaper's worth of content every month. Think about that, right? Airbnb is more valuable than Marriott and Hilton combined, and they don't own any buildings for hospitality. 
Bitcoin is one of the world's largest currencies. Okay, that's backed by electricity, something intangible, and no governments control it. Uber is one of the largest transportation companies in the world. They don't own any vehicles. Green is the world's first power company that really produces no, more, no power. In fact, in fact, we use power to create electricity that can buy more power than we use to create it. Think about that. We can multiply the existing uh, value of electricity that is already in existence. And, and we do have um, some models uh, where we can build it too. So think about this. Would you trade $50 of electricity a month for $100 in cash for your value? That's where we are right now in an organic environment that has never been promoted. We've never used money. We've never asked an exchange to list us. You can go to Uniswap right now and people are saying, hey, I'll trade green at a dollar at one cent, two cents right now. And there's a buying community that says, hey, that's a good deal. I, I'd like to use that green right now. I'll buy that. That has all happened organically. It has happened without promotion, without ICO, with, um, without me, without right. That is already happening organically. This model already works with where we are in, in nodes. What else can we use it for? We can use it for anything. Um, uh, what happens when there are no more power bills? Our mission is to save people money on an action that they have to perform every single month with or without us, teach them how to share it and teach them how to give back where they can actually stake coins um, to help other people's power bills. And I want to, um, um, I want to, um, I want to end this with, uh, I'm running out of time. I want to end with a concept that's, um, I want to go back to my launch pad. Um, hang on a second. Um, what are my goals? This is what I'm doing. This is what I am doing over the next six months. And um, I'd love for any of you that want to partner with me on this to do this with me. First step is I want to build a global business team to further the adoption of green. Um, we want to sell, install, and run nodes to get this more distributed. We are already one of the most widely distributed blockchain projects in the world. We already have more active nodes than most major blockchain projects, but we want to add more. This is, this is where we create value in our ecosystem. This is where we create processing power. This is where we validate truth. We want to sell out the nodes. So it's taken three and a half years to sell half of the nodes. I want to sell the rest of the nodes for you in a year. That's my goal, right? And so as we do, it's a smart contract. As we do, every node we sell increases the value of the next node. The nodes at Gala that were selling for $5,600 a year and a half ago are selling for $98,000 today. And so if I execute on my vision, that's how much the nodes should be selling for in the future because that will be the value created, right? So we want to sell and install nodes, not to make money. Again, a lot of the profit from the selling of nodes actually goes back in, in the form of rewards to the green community. We want to sell this because this is our infrastructure. Okay, this is our decentralized infrastructure. So I am looking to build a team of people um, that want to buy notes. The people that I'm calling um, all want to buy 50 to 100 notes. So I'm going to the most successful people that I know because I want to put them in the same position as Jack Dorsey. So Jack Dorsey has uh, built two of the largest uh, companies in the world, Twitter and Foursquare. And he got involved in Bitcoin very, very early. And so as Bitcoin, right, uh, started getting market adoption and people started using it. Um, and the value of Bitcoin started going up because people were using it. Jack said, you know what? I think this is valuable. I think I want um, my payment company to accept Bitcoin. So um, the first thing he did, so this is my near-term strategy checklist. I, I'll go back to this. Um, but I want to put global leaders, right? So I'm from the United States and I know solar. So when you talk to me about green, I see how it's going to work in solar right away. Right? I see it's how it's going to work for people's power bills right away, but it can be used for so much more. I want to build a team of global leaders who are helping us integrate this technology into their businesses. What motivates them to do that is getting them early exposure to this project where they can still buy nodes so that they are a part of the infrastructure in the backbone before this gets launched globally. Jack owns a lot of Bitcoin. Jack mines Bitcoin. I want you to consider this. I don't want you to buy green. I want you to mine it. 
Buying green doesn't teach you about green. Mining green teaches you about green. Mining Bitcoin helps you understand Bitcoin. It's totally different than buying Bitcoin. When you own a Bitcoin miners, you get rewards for owning Bitcoin miners. The rewards are Bitcoin and transaction fees. The rewards for owning green nodes are going to be um, uh, green coins, uh, NFT drops from raffles and lotteries, transaction fees, and voting. So that people that own nodes today, right? There's only 100,000 nodes. The people that own those nodes get to vote on what green is going to look like a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. This is the opportunity we want to take some of the most successful people on the planet to get them early exposure. First, they'll help us decentralize the platform by setting up owning equipment. Second, they'll figure out how to integrate it with their business. And third, people like me and Jack are going to say, as the value increases over time, they're going to say, you know what? It's easier for me to create a billion dollars with a value um, as a co-creator in this than it is to try to sign up another software company with 5,000 employees and spend full time raising money and then have everybody tell me what I can and can't say on my own platform that I created. Right? He quit Twitter because Twitter controls him. And because he thinks it's better to increase the value of his Bitcoin holdings than he does create more shareholder value for shareholders that want to control him and tell him what to do. And I think a lot of the most successful men and women like in the planet want to do the same thing. I do. I could easily start another company today and create hundreds of millions of dollars worth of value through shares, but I don't want to play that game anymore. I don't think it's fair and it's definitely not fun. Okay, so we want to do this. The second big priority is I want to launch the switch credit card. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is a huge development this year, this month. It's happening right now. So if, if, if utilities all over the world are going to accept Bitcoin, um, they got to change all their systems. But almost no power companies anywhere in the world are accepting Bitcoin. How are we going to take every, how are we going to get every single power company in the world to accept green easily? We do the exchange for them. So this project has literally been paused for almost two years as we develop our own bank and our own credit card in, like as, a, as a tangent project inside the same ecosystem. So your green node in just a few weeks, like right now, you'll be able to push your rewards directly to a credit card and you can just give the credit card to someone and you don't have to transfer from your wallet or you don't have to wait 20 minutes for the Bitcoin network to validate transactions. You can just spend it like your local currency. And here's what I love about this because um, Getting adoption is going to involve changing human behavior. And changing human behavior is like the hardest thing in the world to do. We don't have to change human behavior. We can get a customer to mine nodes or buy green and stake it on their credit card and then just connect their credit card to an automatic bill pay service with their utility company. Almost all utilities give you a discount if you set up automatic bill pay. We take the credit card transaction fees and we give the customer an extra discount in the form of a green reward. We get them NFT drops that could be free power for a month, free power for a quarter, free power for a year. And they, the more green they spend on their power bill, the more green they um, get in form of a reverse staking. And we're, 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 I'm, I'm baking out the math right now. And, we'll, and my next goal is to release all the math and all the rewards as soon as possible um, in a fully transparent document that the whole ecosystem have access to. Um, and so um, those are the projects that I believe um, are hugely meaningful to this ecosystem and, and, and can be accomplished, can 100% be accomplished in the next six months with the resources that I have uh, available to me. And because this, this, um, this project has been in development for um, for so long, and there's so many things for me to leverage when I that I'm here, and I've I've run like eight minutes late here. I know there's uh, there's a German group that we're gonna do here. I'm really sorry, um, uh, team, for this, but I skipped a lot of stuff too. There's there's so much here. What I wanted to leave, you know what? I'm gonna take one more minute. No one's going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Where are we gonna go? Here's what I want to show you. So you're thinking to yourself, think to yourself. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. 
If someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you're not sure you can do it, say yes and learn how to do it. You don't have to be a blockchain expert. I'm telling you, mining cryptocurrency is the way to become a blockchain expert. The reason why I know so much is I started mining Bitcoin. I learned way more in my first three months mining Bitcoin than I did in my first three years in blockchain combined because it was like the aha moment. It's like, it was like looking behind the curtain. I'm like, this is why it works. You want, right? Tesla is running Bitcoin nodes. Tesla is asking for something that's a hundred times more efficient than Bitcoin. You can run that node now, today, right now. So how do you do something that no one's ever done? This is what we did at Lumio. This is what I told my team. You just got to be willing and relentless. No one has ever done this. Ladies and gentlemen, we could fail hugely. Like, I want you to know that. I want everybody to know this. Like, this project could be one of the biggest failures in the history of blockchain. But what if it's not? Right? What if we build a team of people that are just as willing and just as relentless as your leaders, as me? What if we create a movement around the world like Bitcoin did, but, but with the hindsight of, where Bitcoin failed over the last 13 years, what if we give us a, a better version of this? And what if we accomplish this? How, you, can't, you can't be trained to do something that no one else has ever done. You got to just do it. And this is what I challenge my Lumio team. And this is how I want to challenge uh, the business team here is you just got to do it. You got to get involved. You got to learn the hard way. You got to do it. And you got to do new things. You got to do tough things. You got to overcome a bunch of stuff that seems like it's unnecessary, seems like it's a waste of time, seems like it's too difficult. It shouldn't be this way. They should be better. It should be easier. It's not. Turns out it's really, really hard to change the world. But we can change the world here. We can literally change the world here. So Nigel, I'm going to turn this back to you. And I'm so sorry that I'm running late on your German crew. Um, we'll make up extra special time for them. You let them in. But um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited to be here. I, I hope that comes through. Um, and, uh, and you know, these nodes are going to sell out really fast, in my opinion. So I'm not even really focused on the sales piece. I'm 100% focused on the operations and building systems that will not embarrass you. But right now, the systems will embarrass you because we are in an epic. No, we are. We are. You got to read Blitzscaling. We are assembling this project in real time. We have jumped down of the plane and we are assembling the smaller plane on the way to the ground. And it's going to be messy and risky and frustrating. And we're going to change the world. So. Well, thank I you, hope, Jonathan. I hope, none of you, I hope none of you can sleep tonight. <laughs> I, I'm sure they won't. And uh, I know you've got to run to your other call, so I'm, we're not going to hold you up any longer. And I know this stuff that you wanted to say, so maybe we can invite you to come on another call sometime soon as well, so we can get into Absolutely. some of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much. I, there's really, I'm speechless, there's nothing I can say. How can I follow that? Except, uh, who's who's in it? Who's in, Who's with us for this I'm journey? In. I'm come in, on. I'm all show, in. Show us that. We're gonna make, we're gonna change the world. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, we'll see you at the top. And uh, watch out for, by the way, on Thursday, remember, we have our call with Steve Little, who is the new uh, president of Connect as well. So this is an exciting week, everyone. This is, this is the moment a lot of us have been waiting for. And you're going to look back on this and say, you know what? I was there. You know, when that launched, when that kicked off, when they had that, that first call, I was there. Don't ever forget this. Thank you and good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your evening and morning with me.